Hello and welcome. Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent and the readings for the Eucharist are found in St John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. Now amongst those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder, and others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. He said this to indicate kind of death he was to die. Thank you for those of you who've been praying for me. I'm sorry I haven't been around weekly for some time now, but I've been having eye operations and they've gone reasonably well. Uh, so thank you for your prayers. And this brings us to near the, the end of Lent itself. The reading here is a very sombre one. There's a clear sense of a climax growing. But the beginning of the reading looks happy enough. The Greeks, some tourists, some pilgrims, whatever they were doing, were looking for Jesus. And so they came to Philip and say, we'd like to see him. Could you arrange for a personal meeting, please? Well, Philip's not quite sure what to do about it. So he goes to Andrew and, and together they go to Jesus and say, you know, you've become a celebrity. Even the Greeks want to talk to you about it. And Jesus response was really very strange. He didn't address the question at all. He did what he so often does, which is not to fall for the presenting issue, but to look for the one behind it. What he was dealing with in his own mind and as he talked to the disciples was his celebrity status. The fact that he was doing really rather well in the world. People were coming to find him from all over the place. And the Greeks the Greeks in, in the Jews' eyes were, were the intellectuals, they were the sophisticates. They were the people who had ruled, ruled having invaded Israel under, under the Maccabees. The Jews were the, old, the, the Greeks were the, were the old colonialists, colonialists, the top dogs. And so Jesus is now reflecting on success in the world, the Greeks representing it, and rationality and, and intelligence and philosophy, for that was what the Greeks represented, and his coming death. And as he held these two series of values and experiences in his mind, he reflected upon them. And he talked about Satan. He talked about Satan being driven out by his death. And then he talked about death being necessary. And then he invited people to, to serve him and to remain close to him. And suddenly we hear about this extraordinary voice from heaven. And this voice sets up, if you like, the paradigm of the story. Because the people who are listening to him are divided into, into two groups immediately. The father says, when Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. That's, that is what this whole thing is about, driving the devil out. Glorify your name. And the Father says, I have glorified it. I will glorify it some more. But not everyone hears the Father. 
For some people it's simply thunder. And other people know something miraculous and mysterious has taken place. And they say, well, this must be some kind of angel. And certainly in Hebrew spirituality, the presence of God and an angel of God are often mixed up so that we can't tell the difference. And Jesus said, the voice wasn't for me, it was for you. But already we can see that half of the people have no idea what it means. And the other half have some idea, but are a bit confused. In order to understand this, we need to come and look at the Gospels in a particular context. And Lent helps us do that. But the, the, the viewpoint I'm going to suggest is not very popular. And you don't hear it preached in church very much because clergy are embarrassed by it. They're frightened of evil. They don't understand it very often. And theologically, they try and push it to one side. I remember when my, my sense of who the devil was was less focused. How, how difficult I found so much of the New Testament. Because all the way through the New Testament, you have this constant confrontation between Jesus and Satan. Interestingly enough, the Gospels of Luke and Matthew pretty well begin with Jesus going out into the desert in order to begin his ministry, which involves confronting Satan. And there, Satan tries to derail him. De derail him. Jesus is going to dethrone Satan, and Satan intends to derail Jesus, if he can. He can't. He fails. He is overcome. But that is the basic framework in which so much of the gospel drama is placed, which we need to hold in our minds in order to understand. Because by nature, much of us feels very at home in this world. We like this world. We, we make plans for it. Our families live in it. We've been born into it and we find death immensely threatening and difficult. Uh, most of our plans, uh, for, for most of our plans, the world is the reference place. But we find in the New Testament a constant warning that the world is not a place which is under the direct rule of God the Father. There is an intermediate kind of rule. As C.S. Lewis says, it's, of course it, the world is God's, but it's been occupied. It's been occupied by an invading force, and the invading force is the devil. The devil is a temporary ruler of the world we live in. This is, this is profoundly confusing for many of us because we have an instinct that it ought to be the Father. We have an instinct things ought to be good and go well and go right. And it's strange when things go wrong, how many people blame God, as if they had no sense at all that the invader has come and we live in occupied territory and that the real responsibility for the dreadful tragedies that take place is not with God the Father and the Creator, but with the devil. Do you remember how Jesus says when he sends the 70 out in Luke, they come back and they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now you might say, well, this is wonderful, Satan has been dethroned, but I don't think Jesus is, is responding to the immediate success of the disciples. I think he's looking at the geopolitical picture. Go to the book of Revelation in chapter 12, and there you find, uh, it, at verse 12, verse 7, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Because, of course, what Jesus was discussing was the fact that the war was now on in earth. Jesus had come to take the struggle, the war, the battle to Satan. And so John uh, Jesus says uh, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, I'm no longer going to talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. And you find throughout the New Testament this constant teaching by the apostles. St Paul says, remember those whose minds the God of this age has blinded, that Satan, the ruler of the world, lest they should believe in the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. And you remember James in chapter 4 says, Don't you know that friendship with this world is enmity with God? 
Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So it is no wonder that Jesus says, if you want to make your home in this world, if you want to be successful, if you want to find yourself in this world, then the consequences are you will close yourself off to the kingdom of heaven. And here is a terrible, terrible fate for so much New Age religion and, and so much of the therapeutic culture we live in, which is all predicated on people finding themselves here and now, trying to find a salvation for their, their psyches in this world. And Jesus warns that, that anything rooted in this world will shrivel up and die. Where you need, where we need to be rooted, is the kingdom of heaven. And so he reminds us not to make our homes in this world, but to make them in heaven. He reminds us to stick close to him. And if we do, the Father will honour us. He reminds us that he has to die and something in us has to die as well. I used to worry that somehow, unless I succeeded in putting massive parts of myself to death, I, I, I couldn't be saved i couldn't have access to god and i know how difficult it is to deal with those parts of ourselves that 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 we don't want to let go of wonderfully jesus does all the work himself his death on the cross means that a doorway into heaven is opened up for us a doorway marked forgiveness which we walk through having walked through it as we are born again and accept him as our lord as our saviour, as our love, as our, our best friend, as our interpreter of life, as our companion, as we walk through it, we then find that Satan doesn't easily go, but that we feel his fingertips upon parts of our life trying to pull us back. It's almost like being a marionette and with the enemy tying little pieces of, of string or thread around our hands, rather like Gulliver in, uh, in Gulliver's Travels when he was tied down on the beach. And so we have to cut these strands. And that's what we're doing in Lent. In Lent, we're looking at ourselves. Once a year, we go in for a big MOT and we say, where have I put my weight? Where is my home? Where's my appetites? Where are my instincts? Where's my time and my energy going? And during this Lent, we ask the Lord to help us die again to comfort in this world. And that's one of the reasons why people give up food and drink or chocolate or tobacco, some of the small things. It's a small gesture. These things in themselves have very little value, except to remind ourselves that we are not looking for comfort here. This is not where we're going to stay. We are, in fact, heading in a different direction towards heaven. We are going to, we are going to die soon, physically. And when we die physically, then we will spring into eternal life. The death that we have here, as our bodies fall to pieces, as things go wrong, as we become ill, as we face tragedy and difficulty, this is not the sign of a, a hopeless conclusion. This is the sign of our birth pangs, a kind of pregnancy into eternal life. Well, so we have to put up with this difficult part of the journey, knowing that we are preparing for life in heaven, life with Christ. So, as we prepare ourselves with Easter, we examine ourselves, we look at our time, we look at our money, we look at our appetites, we look at our ego, we look at our chart of forgiveness, and we do all that we can to die, to be uncomfortable and invested and rooted in this world, where nothing is safe, there is no permanency. Jesus teaches time and time again that this world is a very dangerous place. Thieves break in. Treasure rusts. Most eat things. The other day, I backed into my television and it fell off the screen and, and smashed. And part of my, me said to myself, this is a dreadful and an expensive tragedy. And another part of myself said, ah, well, this is the death of something that held me. Perhaps Lent is not altogether a bad time to break one's television. But it's not just the breaking of television, it's the breaking of all those things that root us and our attention, our affection and our comfort in this world. Jesus is coming to get us to walk us home. 
Jesus accompanies us and the Holy Spirit keeps on turning our gaze to heaven, to things of eternal life, to the presence of God. The question always is, what are we feeding most? Are we feeding those parts of ourself which aim to be comfortable here? Or are we feeding those parts of ourself that belong to the Father and belong in heaven? None of these things we can do by ourselves. That's the whole point about prayer. Prayer is throwing ourselves into the arms of Jesus and saying, this is all too difficult for me. I'm willing to try, and you know how badly I want this, but you're going to have to help me. I can't do it by myself. And the experience of all of those of us who stick close to Jesus is he does exactly that. He helps us. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves at every level, at the biggest level of forgiveness and the promise of eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And at the smallest level, changing our appetites even, changing our priorities, dealing with our fears, raising our horizons and setting us free from everything that the ruler of this world seeks to trap us with too. As we head towards Easter, we do it hand in hand with each other, joyful at our coming liberation and looking at Christ's death on the cross and his amazing resurrection as the light by which we evaluate everything in our lives too. God bless you and keep you as you celebrate Christ's love for you and his help. Amen.